Web Systems Week 2, Part 3 File Storage. We've seen from the previous um, lecture, mini lectures that the internet is really big and data needs to be stored somewhere. And we looked at the example of Google with 200 terabytes of data that is actually indexed. And we've looked at the question of where data is stored in logical and physical petitions. But where is it physically stored is the big question. So let's take a look at Google. It isn't a single operating system. It isn't a single computer. It's got a lot of computers connected to a lot of servers and something close to 20 plus data centers around the world. This is what we call a distributed file system. At UTS, we've split ours into two. We have two data centers, one in the tower and one in a place called Macquarie Park in Sydney. And typically we put our files into a central system called a storage area network, or SAN. Sometimes that's called a NAS. It's not an anti-SAN, it stands for Network Accessible Storage. And drives on various servers out there. So let's take a quick look at UTS. Now this is the UTS infrastructure. Obviously it's got a lot of stuff there. We've got, uh, let's see if we can find where the tower is. There it is, tower. 10 gig core connections. We've got a firewall to the outside world. And we've got a whole pile of internal connections. We've got a 40 gigabit connection to basically via Chatswood and via Parramatta to the Macquarie Centre data centre. Macquarie data centre, not Macquarie Centre. Containing a lot of things, for example, uh, let's see, we've got um, we've got uh, even the web room booking system, UTS Online is here. We've got databases galore and our Broadway um, centre. We've got various things, maybe not quite as much. For example, we've got the uh, Faculty of Engineering and IT. We've got our own servers, as well as the Faculty of Business have their own servers as well. Up out there. And if we look at the infrastructure of our actual storage system, we've got a Broadway data center storing a great big database called an NFS server, network file system. And we've got our major league database servers out there. We've got servers for Windows and Linux, Unix, and physical servers, of course. And of course, all these giant things called tape drives and physical backups and so on. A lot of stuff out there. And we actually connect to our remote data centers. Um, Kurian Guy, unfortunately, is now gone. But we'd store backups at Macquarie as well. So you can see what we do here. We, we have a backup three to four times a day. The sheer amount of data that transfers is extremely large. And that's why we have a 40 gig backbone to do that stuff. And if you look at our infrastructure at UTS, I guess from our internal design, you can see we've got lots of things. We've got um, systems designed to cope with desktops. So I've got a desktop in my office. Of course, these lecterns themselves are desktops as well. Um, people have various things like uh, private networks. We've got things like um, databases. And we've got our physical storage. Now, this is the storage I was talking about called a storage area network, SAN. I think it's in the order of multiple, multiple terabytes of data. Generally, we don't have to worry about that unless you plan to do the internet working major, where you'll get to know this stuff in more intimate detail. So, where are these files stored? Typically, most um, computers have a one physical storage device at least. Now, it could be a hard disk. Uh, for example, or well, here's an example. I've got a, uh, I've got a Seagate installed in my machine. And uh, roughly speaking, one terabyte is about $80. And you can also have a solid state drive as well. My laptop also has a second drive. Um, it's using a thing called an MSATA drive. That's this little tiny thing over here. It's a solid state drive, and it's roughly about 120 gigabytes, cost $80. So you can see in terms of price, big difference. One terabyte for $80, 120 gigabytes of solid state for $80. Eventually, the price will get cheaper. It's catching up slowly. Um, obviously, this is the hard drive. This is a solid state drive, a two and a half inch drive, and that's an MSATA drive. The current state of the art is called M.2. So let's take a look at these actual physical disks. Now, physically, a disk is obviously something that does have a presence. It's physical. Uh, it's got certain structures inside it, and you allocate files on it in a certain way. We'll talk about these separately. Our disk infrastructure our logical structure and our file allocation. Physically, 
discs, or at least the old discs, the physical hard discs, are organised into certain concepts. They're organised into things called tracks, heads, cylinders, and sectors. And I'll show you what they look like in a moment. Okay, a disc is actually a physical thing. It's actually a circular thing called a magnetic disc, and certain tracks are laid on using magnetic patterns. And this track, this little line, this yellow line here, represents a concentric ring on that physical disc that holds the data in things called blocks. These little blocks here, and they're typically organised in things called sectors, little groups. And you have multiple discs. This is an example of three separate discs. And each disc would typically have two heads, one at the top, one at the bottom. So this particular configuration has six heads. One, two, three, four, five, six. So let's take a look. This is an example of a physical hard disc. Notice that it rotates, and it typically will rotate 5,000, 7,000, 10,000, 15,000 times a minute. So it's pretty fast. Even at this slow rate, it's pretty fast at moving. Notice what I've done is I've drawn out a typical example of tracks. These little blocks represent data, and this head, this little thing here, moves forward and backwards. At the very tip is a head. So it reads this disc, it goes like this. It always moves tracks one bit at a time. There you go. Just rotate it and just imagine the head moving forward and backwards. Each time it moves in and out, it reads a, uh, a track around the perimeter. Okay. You might notice if you take a look inside, i get the focus working here, there's actually multiple heads in this device. It's back and forth, like that. So it's double-sided, each one of these platters. And that vertical um, setup is called a cylinder. So you go, a physical hard disk. Here's a laptop one, a bit smaller. It does the same thing, it moves back and forth. You just can't really quite see it move as well. And again, that head moves forward and backwards, like this. And that's a hard disk. And by the way, this is immensely heavy. That's about over one and a half kilograms. I wouldn't put that in my laptop. So as you've seen, this disk is a stack of magnetic platters. I described what they were, and cylinders, and tracks, and so on. The read-write operation is handled by those heads, and they're actually magnetic heads. They actually read and write magnetic patterns on the disk. And the key thing is, is that they move at what they call a constant angular velocity. In other words, the disk moves always at the same speed. The head moves in and out. It's slightly different with a DVD. A DVD, the actual speed of the disc changes depending on where the head is. So it's slightly slower in the inside, but slightly faster on the outside. So the, the speed of the actual um, turning of the DVDs are different. So just be careful. DVDs are not the same as hard disks. Of course, that's obsolete. Everything is eventually going to be replaced with what I believe is called solid state hard disks. No moving parts, but the problem is because of history, we still treat them like a hard disk. So as far as an operating system is concerned, they still have blocks and they still worry about how things are accessed. There are new technologies to get around it. For example, PCIe, where we have direct access to the solar state through the actual system's main bus. It's the main communication, so someone's directly attached to the CPU really fast. Or non-volatile memory express interface, which means it's treated like a block of memory super fast. The old-fashioned way was called SATA, S-A-T-A, Serial ATA Interface, whatever the ATA stands for. Runs at certain speeds, but SSDs are at least an order of magnitude faster. And the good news is, some of the latest developments, including 3D uh, solid-state disks, means that we can actually make cheaper um, solid-state disks in the very near future. In fact, probably this year you'll find the prices are going to drop dramatically, and they already have. Now, a few more things you have to do with these physical infrastructures. You have to physically format it. That means you have to set up these little blocks like you saw in that diagram. And this is done typically at a hardware level. Each device you've got, each hard disk or solid state disk, has a small microcontroller inside it. It's like a small little computer itself, which decides how the actual physical disk will be formatted. And then it translates that physical formatting 
to a logical formatting and connects to the computer via its interface. Um, one of the key things you should be careful of, Microsoft, when you format a disk, that's not actually formatting. Technically, you're actually not actually formatting a disk. You're actually writing a logical structure on top, but it's not the physical formatting. So just be careful of that. That's why when you format a hard disk in Windows, you can retrieve the data. It doesn't actually write to the disk in most cases. Just reset some structures. That's all it does. That's why it can be really fast, especially with quick formatting. So let's take a look at this mystical thing I keep talking about called disk logical structures. Now, you've seen I mentioned before that you can have partitions. And typically, they, they are represented as drives and windows. In Linux, you mount these drives. We won't worry about that unless you do my network servers class. But you can also take a physical disk and break it up into multiple partitions. In most cases in Windows, you typically will have two partitions. A partition at the top, which is usually roughly 100 megabytes, called a boot partition. And the second drive, typically be drive C, would be your main data. It's usually the rest, but some people increase it. They say it will have a third one, maybe drive D, for example. Each is considered by the operating system to be independent. Of course it isn't, because if you physically shut down that device, you lose three drives at once. What the operating system does is it puts, makes every one of these partitions look like a giant array of blocks, called logical blocks, and it's the smallest unit you can transfer. Um, some operating systems say it's 512 bytes, some say it's four kilobytes, some say it's 16 kilobytes or something like that, or more. Um, 65535 kilobytes. One megabyte, it, it really depends on the partitioning and the operating system and the file system that you're using. So you have to look it up. Just be careful, because it's a fixed logical block, if I create a file with one byte, it still takes a whole block on disk. So in the case of a 4K block size, it still takes four kilobytes of space on your disk, even though I've only used one byte. So just be careful of that. So here's an example of Windows. Um, you can see that we've got various partitions set up. I've got my boot partition, and this turns out to be 100 meg, like I said. We've got drive C. Now notice drive C doesn't have to be the first one. It's actually got 590, uh, 500, sorry, that's my apology, 60 gigabytes of space. You round them up. And I've got two physical drives in the system, disk 0 and disk 1. So in my case, I've got two, and a CD-ROM, of course. So let's take a look at how these files are actually allocated onto a system. Well, let's take a look. Here's a sample of a file I've called PhoneBook. And it's got data inside it. It's an address book. How's it stored? Well, it depends. Typically what happens is a chunk of the file is stored in a thing called a block. So just for example, let's say each row is stored in a block on your physical disk. Okay? So in this particular example, I've got 11 blocks. 1 to 11. This happens to coincide with the length of the row. It doesn't have to, but just, just in this particular case. And a directory is another special type of file that's basically a list of that associates a name with a list of blocks. So this or directory would say, for example, home CW would contain three files, home book, students, and staff, and these files are stored somewhere. Okay? So a directory is the index into files. So <coughs> good question we've got how are these physically stored on disk? And the big other question is, is how do I access it and how long does it take to access it? Now if we have a humongous file, this could take a long time, but let's see what we can do. So we want to see how do we access this file, how do we write and update it efficiently. Let's see, for example, row three. Problem is, I can't really tell you. It depends on how the file is allocated on disk. And there's real three methods of allocating files. The first one's called contiguous, the second one's called chained, the third one's called indexed. Now a contiguous one is quite simple. Files are allocated at the time of file creation. So it means when I create this file, 
I simply allocate each block 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 13 in this case. And to access information, I would have to know exactly where it starts. In this case, I say it starts at 1. And which block do I want to read? So if I want to read block 6, I'll go, OK, it's 1, there's 6. Easy. So the good news is I know how to get exactly to which block in almost one read. So if I read block 12, I say, OK, I know where the first one is. Internally, I know block 12 is going to be here. One read. Downside to this is fragmentation, and I've got a little video to show you. The second type of allocation is called chained allocation. The idea is, is that the file is a list of blocks which don't have to be contiguous, they don't have to be next to each other, and they have pointers to the next block. And it's probably best to look at the animation to understand what it is. I'll just talk, briefly talk to you about it though. Each block contains a pointer, and typically a pointer is simply a number, which is the next number of the next block. And the very last block contains a special indicator that says this is the last block. A directory would tame the pointer to the start of this file and the length of the file. So I'll just skip through this. You can see the video in this section. This linked animation is probably more descriptive. Take a look at that and see what it's like. The third type of allocation is called indexed. And this is quite good. It's a tree-based allocation system. There's a special block called an index block, which points to the next data block. If the file's too big, the index block will point to other index blocks. So this is called a second, or it's called an indirect block. That points to more. And you can see you can have this block can contain an index block as well, which points to more index blocks. So you can practically have an infinite storage size. It will depend on the operating system and the file system you've got, but it's a very, very expandable um, system. And again, best look at the video. The animation will show you good examples of how it works. In Unix in particular, everything is stored again as a tree or an indexed system. Each block is a special block called an inode. Fancy name for indexed node. And each file and directory is referenced by an inode. So the directory, file A would point to index 1, which points to this one. Block 2, file B points to block 2. And this, this inode block 2 would actually point to the data containing the files. In this example, it's interleaved. It's very efficient and very fast and very flexible. In Unix, it's quite good because these nodes are uniform regardless of the type of file system we've got. There's a special type of inode or block called a directory. And these directories contain the names of the files and the inode number for the file. And again, it's a tree inodes actually can store more than just the blocks. We actually store what we call metadata. It's the size, who owns it, what permissions, what timestamps. Important thing to note, the inode doesn't contain the name of the file. It's contained in the directory instead. Good news is, you can run a thing called deduplication if you wish. You can actually have blocks that are common, can be shared by more than one file, for example. I did mention these things called indirect blocks. They're pointers to blocks. You can go up to three levels in typical Unix systems. Double indirect blocks. Here's an example of what an inode looks like. File data. And you've seen this through Linux Gym Chapter 3, which has permissions. That's actually stored in the file. And you have pointers to these different data blocks and pointers to the blocks which contain more data about the, the extension blocks for this file. Here's an example of an extreme example of Unix an inode pointing to data blocks, pointing to index blocks, pointing to double index blocks, pointing to triple index blocks. Hypothetically, files in Unix could often be up to 2 to 32 blocks, or even larger, depending on the new versions. Good thing about inodes, and I did mention before, you can have different file names pointing to the same inode, which means you have different names for the same file. In Linux and Unix, we call these links, L-I-N-K-S. So, conclusion. There's three different types of file allocations out there. 
depends on your operating system. Contiguous is good when you want to have direct storage. Chained is good for archival. Single long links to files. And indexed is quite good for large, large systems. We'll talk about complexity next because that will tell us basically which one should I use in which situation.